Okay, this is unit two cells. We are gonna start concept one notes for honors or advanced students and on the cell theory and organelles. And hopefully this part is extremely familiar to you. So cell theory, these are three principles we know to be true about cells. One, all living things are made of cells. Two, cells are the basic unit of life and three, all cells come from other cells. Now, in this concept, we're really going to zoom in on numbers one and two here. Number three, that's going to come up again in concept three. We'll have a whole entire concept on mitosis, the cell cycle, and talking about how cells come from other cells. So we're going to zoom in on these first two, though, today. So although all living things are made of cells, like the cell theory states, Organisms are either unicellular or multicellular. Unicellular means you're just made of one cell. So there are bacteria and protists that literally the entire organism is just one single cell. That's it. Other organisms are multicellular. So they're much more complex. They're made of trillions of cells, um, or they can be made of trillions of cells like humans are. And those cells get organized into tissues, which are organized into organs, which are organized into organ systems, which make up the entire organism. So much more complicated in structure. But regardless of if you're a single-celled bacterium or you're a trillions of cell puppy, you are still a living thing made of cells. Second, we said cells are the most basic unit of life. That means it's the smallest part of an organism that is still capable of all of life's processes. But just because it's this basic unit of life that all life is kind of built up and organized upon structurally, they are still extremely diverse. And there are two broad categories, and even still within these categories, they're diverse. But two broad categories are prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. So what are the differences? The main differences are the present is the presence or absence of the nucleus. So pro means no. Pro means no. Prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus, and eukaryotic cells like you, you are a eukaryote, they do have a nucleus. Prokaryotic um, cells do not have organelles, and eukaryotic cells do have the membrane-bound organelles. Prokaryotic divide by a process called binary fission eukaryotic divide by mitosis, which we'll talk about in concept three. Organisms that are made of prokaryotic cells, I should really say, or are, are made of a prokaryotic cell because they are unicellular. They're just made of one single prokaryotic cell, whereas eukaryotic organisms are either uni or multicellular. Protists are eukaryotes and they are one single eukaryotic cell. Plants and animals and fungi, we are all multicellular eukaryotes. Prokaryotes also have cell walls, which is the outermost structure made of peptidoglycan. Some eukaryotes have cell walls, but not all. Fungi and plants do. Um, fungi, theirs is made of chitin, and plants is made of cellulose. So examples of organisms that are composed of this type of cell, bacteria are prokaryotes, and then animals, plants, fungi, and protists are all eukaryotes. So although there are two main types of cells, uh, the prokaryotes and eukaryotes, all cells have these four things. They all have genetic material, either DNA or RNA. In prokaryotes, it's just floating around in the cytoplasm typically. In eukaryotes, it's in the nucleus. They all have cytoplasm, which is the fluid that's on the inside of the cell that biochemical reactions occur in. They all have a cell membrane. Um, if you have a cell wall, it's the next most layer. If you don't have a cell wall, it's the outermost layer of the cell. And then they all have ribosomes. Ribosomes make proteins and proteins run your cells and because they run your cells then they run basically everything just at a cellular level they are so so important so all cells have those four things but eukaryotic cells also have all these extra organelles and organelles are specialized structures within the cell that work together to help the cell function think of them as mini organs within the cell and they work for one general purpose, which is to make proteins. But different types of cells in your body have different compositions of organelles. For instance, you know, your skeletal muscle cells that help your muscles contract, 
those have a ton of mitochondria because they need lots of energy to do what they do. So one key theme of biology is that form dictates function. So the structure of something dictates what it will do. And so we're going to review these organelles that hopefully are familiar to you and just know not every cell has all of these and they will have the ones that they need to do that the job that they're intended to do. Um, this is picture is of an animal cell and this is of a plant one. As we go through these organelles, we're going to be focusing on identifying where these are and what they look like in animal and plant cells. But just remember, fungi and protists are also eukaryotes, so they will have a lot of these structures too. Okay, in class, we're not just going to sit and talk through these notes for hours. That would be super boring. So we're going to actually go through these organelles as stations. But for the sake of this video, I'm going to go through them as quickly as I can, just as a brief um, oral review. But just know we'll do spend more time on this in class. Okay, the cell membrane, also referred to as the plasma membrane. Its structure, it surrounds the outside of all cells. Now, some cells have the additional surrounding um, structure of the cell wall, but every cell has a cell membrane. And it has two layers known as the phospholipid bilayer. Its job is to control what goes in, out of, in and out and of the cell, and it's able to do that because of its phospholipid bilayer structure. It is critical for communication within the cell and between cells, essentially, and maintaining a stable internal environment, which is known as homeostasis. We're going to be talking all about homeostasis in concept two. In the animal cell, it's the outermost layer, and the plant and prokaryotic cell, it is the next innermost layer because the cell wall is on the very, very outside. So I said the cell membrane is composed of a phospholipid bilayer. That just means two layers of fats, specifically phospholipids, which we mentioned or we learned about in Unit 1 Biology Basics. Phospholipids have a really unique structure. They have this hydrophilic head, which likes water, and hydrophobic tails, which do not like water. And they arrange themselves in this bilayer. So the extracellular fluid outside of the cell is mainly water, as is the intracellular fluid. It's mainly water. So those hydrophilic heads, they face the outside and inside of the cell. And then the hydrophobic tails that are scared of water face inside and that's what gives it this very unique structure and it's going to really affect what's allowed in and out of the cell which we'll see in unit two cell transport there is a lot going on though in the bilayer it's not just these two layers of phospholipids as you can see here there are also proteins embedded which play critical roles for transporting things in and out of the cell as channels and as carriers there are carbs which are embedded for structure and also for communication and tagging things. And because of this diversity and this variation, if you will, in the structure, it is referred to as a fluid mosaic model. There are so many parts and there's fluidity to them. They're not rigid and they move around, but they make up this mosaic um, structure that is the cell membrane. Okay, another organelle is the cytoskeleton. These are thread-like fibers made of proteins. Oftentimes, we won't even see them pictured in a cell diagram. So down here, I specifically chose diagrams where they are pictured for the sake of understanding, but oftentimes, they're not even shown. They give the cell shape, and they also help move organelles around. They And especially for animal cells, they provide some structural support since we don't have cell walls. But... Um, you can see them here, but I mean, just for, think of them as a skeleton, just like your skeleton gives you shape and structure. It does the same for the cell. The cytoplasm, this is a jelly-like substance. That would be kind of the consistency of it, but it's mainly water. It holds everything in place, and it's the solution that a ton of chemical reactions take place in in the cell. So anytime you're labeling it on a picture, it's just that empty space. And it's also in prokaryotic cells too. That's It's one of those four structures that they all have. All right, the nucleus, this is what makes eukaryotic cells eukaryotes. It contains genetic material, which is our DNA. When DNA appears spread out, so it's going to look kind of like spaghetti, if you will, it's known as chromatin. But when DNA condenses, which it does before the cell divides, which we'll see in concept three, it forms chromosomes. And here, these Xs are actually duplicated chromosomes. So this would be after the S phase of interphase. 
which probably means nothing to you now, but it'll mean a lot in concept three. The nucleus is surrounded by a nuclear envelope or membrane, and it has pores in it. So think about the pores you have in your face, and it allows things in and out. And the job of the nucleus is just to protect the DNA and because your DNA controls the activities of the cell. It's the instructions for making the proteins which run your body. And so we want to keep them um, protected in there. Now, next is the nucleolus. That is inside the nucleus. And its job is it makes something called rRNA or ribosomal RNA. And rRNA makes up ribosomes. And we'll talk more about it in Unit 4 Genetics but it is not in prokaryotes because they don't have a nucleus, so they can't have a nucleolus either. Okay, ribosomes. This is one of the most important structures. It is in all cells. Ribosomes are made of proteins and rRNA. They're not anything special about how they necessarily look in a picture. They're typically just pictured as circles or dots. They, you can find them in two places though. They can be located on the rough ER, um, or like here we can see in the rough ER, or here we can see them floating in the cytoplasm. Ribosomes make proteins in a process called translation, which we'll learn in detail in Unit 4. So ribosomes on the rough ER, they're specifically making proteins that'll be exported out of the cell. Ribosomes that float in our cytoplasm are just making proteins that we're going to actually use within our cells. All right, let's talk about that rough ER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It has ribosomes on its surface. That's what makes it rough. It hugs the nucleus, so you can always find it hug it right around the nucleus. And its job is to make proteins. That's what it does. If you remember from Unit 1, when we talked about the structure of proteins, they have four levels of structure because they're so diverse and so specific in their structure. And so some of that will happen here, some of that folding um, and making that, um, that complex structure will happen here. And then... They will get packaged for secretion and then sent in vesicles to the Golgi. So that is where the rough ER is located. It's not in prokaryotes. All right, we're going to talk about the smooth ER and then we'll jump to the Golgi. So this is just outside of the rough ER. It does not have ribosomes. That's what makes it smooth. It does a ton of stuff. But um, two of the things it does is it makes lipids or membrane, and it also stores calcium, which is incredibly important for triggering a ton of cell responses. It uh, can also chemically modify some small molecules, and glycogen gets um, glycogen de wow. glycogen degradation happens here as well. But these are the two main things I want students in my class to remember. Okay, let's talk about that Golgi apparatus. Some refer to it as the Golgi body. It kind of looks similar to the ER, but it's, it's not attached to the nucleus, so it's always separate. It's just a bunch of folded membrane, which is why it looks similar. And its job is it gets vesicles of protein from the ER, and it's going to process them further. So vesicles are these mini carts, and they transport proteins around the cell. So they'll take them from the rough ER to the Golgi. The Golgi is going to process them more and sort them more and then ship the proteins where they need to go. And we can see it here, and it would not be in the prokaryotes. Lysosomes. There is nothing special about how this is going to be pictured anywhere, so I will rarely have you label it. But their structure is important because they contain a bunch of enzymes. And that makes it possible for them to break down dead stuff in the cell, either food waste, um, invading bacteria, old parts of the cell that get worn out and are not useful anymore that we want to get rid of. And then lysosomes can also do programmed cell death, which is also known as apoptosis. It's essentially cell suicide. And this is an incredibly important thing that our cells can do, and we will talk about it more um, in concept three. Now, it is generally thought of to be animal cells only. There is a slight controversy among cell biologists. Some think that now some plant cells might have lysosomes. But in general, we associate them with animal cells. Okay, vacuoles. They are small and numerous in animal cells. In plant cells, there's typically just one large central one. And their job is to store water, nutrients, waste, etc. They store things. Centrioles. Centrioles are made of microtubules. Two of them together is referred to as a centrosome. So sometimes these words get used interchangeably. Um, and they can be pictured some different ways. So I try to show a couple of the ways that they're often pictured. Their job is they kind of, you know, appear during cell division. They kind of organize it during cell division. 
and they help the cell divide by pulling chromosomes apart. So we're going to see how they do that with the spindle fibers um, that have come out of them during concept three when we learn about mitosis. So you can see them here. They're animal cells only. Um, plant cells, when they do cell division, um, they have a different microtubule based structure that helps them. Okay, cilia and flagella, these are organelles associated with our cytoskeleton. Cilia are shorter and more numerous, like tiny ores. Um, there are a, a similar structure, something called microvilli, um, but they microvilli don't move. So cilia move, think of them again like tiny ores on like a Viking ship. Microvilli stay still. Um, flagella are longer and fewer, so there will either be one flagellum or there can be up to three on some cells. So their jobs were, are related to movement. Cilia move fluid across the cell surface. So think about there are cilia on the cells in your throat that help to move fluids down your throat. Flagella move the entire cell through extracellular fluid. So in this picture, we see sperm, a bunch of sperm cells. They each have a singular flagellum as their tail, and they're swimming towards an egg cell trying to fertilize it. This shows outside of a human body cell that has microvilli. So the cilia that, um, it looks like cilia though, but they, they don't move. We only find these in, in animal and technically bacteria cells. Okay, mitochondria. You may see this and think mighty mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell. Well, friends, welcome to Biology 1 because there's way more we're going to learn about mitochondria. Starting with its structure, there are two parts, the inner membrane and then the fluid part is known as the mitochondrial matrix. The job of the mitochondria, this is where cellular respiration happens. C6H12O6, which is glucose, and six oxygens um, get chemically converted to carbon dioxide, six carbon dioxide, six water molecules, and energy in the form of ATP. So essentially, cellular respiration is the process of breaking down chemical energy stored in the food you eat to release it as usable energy for the cell in the form of ATP. Now, think of the food you eat as a check. When one of your grandparents writes you a check, it's great, you're pumped, but you can't walk into a store and buy something right away. Um, whereas ATP is like cash. Cash, you can use the second you get it. Okay, so what this is cellular respiration in the mitochondria. It's taking checks and converting them to cash. It's taking food and converting it to ATP. And so we're going to have a whole concept about this in unit three energy flow. We'll go into this in detail, but I want you to start learning this equation and learning these terms associated with the mitochondria now. All right, similarly, an important energy structure is the chloroplast. It has two parts also. The um, grana are stacks of thylakoid membrane, and then the fluid part is known as stroma. This is where photosynthesis happens, which is six carbon dioxides and six waters with the help of sunlight make one glucose molecule and six oxygen. It's, it's technically converting light energy from the sun and storing it into chemical energy in the form of sugar. And this is plant cells only. Another plant cell only, well, technically fungus and um, bacteria too, but non-animal cell structure is the cell wall. Cellula made of cellulose in plants, chitin and fungi, and peptidoglycan in bacteria. It protects and maintains shape. So it's the outermost structure um, in these. It technically is in here too, so I'll delete that, but it is in those as well. Central vacuole. It is one massive central structure. It's a storage center, and it's plant cells only. Okay, and now we're gonna practice, practice, practice with these. We'll practice labeling cells, we'll practice comparing and contrasting, and then um, we'll do some other fun practice too.